Um, welcome everyone to this session of uh, TCS Plus. So it's a pleasure to have Casper uh, Green Larsen from Aarhus University to give the talk today. But uh, before we get started, uh, let me ask uh, Ilya, who's operating the talk, if he can uh, go around the room and briefly present the, the groups who are joining us today. Uh, th uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, yeah, so we have several groups today. Uh, we have a Caltech group. Uh, welcome. Uh, then we have a Wisconsin group. Uh, welcome, Wisconsin. Uh, then we have uh, NYU group. Uh, then we have um, University of Michigan group. Uh, then we have Michigan State University. And finally, we have one group which I don't think I recognize who is this. So if you can introduce yourself. Oh, it's probably University of South California, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, excellent. Uh, OK, now back to Casper's slides. And uh, OK, Thomas. OK, thanks, Ilya. So um, before we start, um, I'll also thank all the organizers working behind the scenes. So um, that's in India, who's also joining us, uh, Clément, Godam Kamat, and uh, Odette Regev helping out with the organization of TCS+. Plus. So uh, before we start, let me also uh, announce that two weeks from now, the next talk will be given by uh, Santosh Vempala from Georgia Tech. Today, we're really pleased uh, to have Casper Green Larson uh, from us. So Casper got his uh, PhD in 2013 from RS University um, on uh, the topic of uh, lower bounds for data structures. Um, so before getting his PhD, he already had uh, two best paper awards in uh, Stock and Fox. One of them, as far as I can tell, is, is very related to today's talk. Um, so it was on the topic of proving uh, door bounds for data structures in uh, dynamic data structures. And so today, um, so sorry, after the PhD, Casper went on, uh, he spent a year in industry, and uh, now he's an assistant professor at uh, RS University in Denmark. And today he's going to tell us about uh, data structure lower bounds uh, for dynamic Boolean. Uh, data structures. Uh, all right. So thanks, Casper. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, so I hope you can all hear me. Uh, right, so the work I'm presenting today is uh, joint work with uh, Omri Weinstein from Colombia, who I think will be joining us uh, if they manage to reconnect, and watching you. And um, so this is some work we've been working on for like at least six months together. And I think I've been thinking about this problem for well, since 2012, so I'll try to tell you what the problem is, and it's a great personal satisfaction to finally solve this problem. Um, good, so we'll start out nice and slowly, just to get everyone on the same page. We'll just talk about what are data structures. And so in data structures, we basically care about two types of data structures. Uh, the most basic one is static data structures. And here the goal is basically to represent some data <clears throat> so that you can ask queries about the data and you can answer these queries efficiently. Okay, so an example could be you're given a rogue network, which is the data on the database, and then you want to pre-process it such that if you're given a query, which could be two cities, then you can compute the shortest distance between them along the, uh, the distance between them along the shortest path. So for instance, the input could be this uh, graph here. Uh, the nodes are the cities, you have uh, length on the edges, and then a query could be the pair a comma c, and you have to return the length of the shortest path, which in this case is seven, right? So I think you all know this from introduction to algorithms and data structures, this type of, of problem. And of course, uh, in data structures, we have different types of solutions. For this problem, for instance, one thing you could try to do was just to pre-compute all the possible answers and store them in a big lookup table. Right, so when you get a query, you can just look up the answer in constant time and, and, and you know the result. Uh, the other solution is you maybe just store the graph as it is. And then when you get your query, you, you run the shortest path algorithm, which of course takes a long time. So what you see here is that there's really what we're interested in here is this trade-off between the we spend answering a query and the amount of space that we use to represent the data. Right. So we, these two examples are really the two extremes, right, right? You can have constant query time, but you have space proportional to the number of queries. Or you could have space linear in the input size, but query time that's linear in the input size as well. Right, so these are the sort of the, the two extremes. And in general, we just care about what are the possible trade-offs between uh, the space usage and the time usage. 
So that's what we care about in static data structures. Now, this talk is going to be about dynamic data structures. And so in dynamic data structures, uh, the goal is to represent, again, some set of data, but now the data uh, undergoes changes, right? So you have update operations to your data, and you can still ask queries as you go along, right? So for instance, just as a toy example, you could want to say you want to represent the employees of a company, and maybe you can hire someone new, that's an update, you can add an employee to your company, and you can answer a query which could be like, give me the total salary expenses to everyone hired on or before 2004, right? So that's the query that has an answer. So updates change the underlying data and queries are still queries. Okay. Now, if you want to solve this uh, toy problem where you can add employees, they're hired in some year, they have some salary, one way you could uh, build a data structure for it is to just have an, an array with an entry for every year you could be hired. And, oh, something's wrong with the text. Okay, but initially, so you have one of these variables for every um, year you could be hired. And, okay, let me just close this email. And, okay, sorry about that. So you have a, a variable for every year you could be hired. When you get a new employee, you just uh, add uh, his salary to the year you're hired in. So say you add some employee in 2005 with a salary of four, just add four to this variable. Again, you get another update. You have to hire someone in 2000 with a salary of two. You add something to, to the corresponding variable. And then uh, if you get a query that asks for the total salary expenses to those hired on or before 2007, you just run through all the corresponding variables and sum them up. Okay. So I don't know what went wrong with these text labels here, I'm sorry about that. But so, so the idea is just to sum up over all the years up to 2007, okay. So again, here you have some trade-off between the update time, which is constant in this case, right? You just increment the variable. And the query time can then be linear in the number of years you can be hired, right? So this is like one extreme of a trade-off again. Another thing you could do was to try to balance the time that you spend updating your data and the time you spend answering queries. So another representation would be to store, uh, have a bi balanced binary tree on top of your data, and every node stores the sum of all the salary expenses to those hired on a before on a year in the subtree. Right. So this is like a prefix sum data structure. So if you go through the same sequence of updates, if you hire someone in two thousand and five, you traverse this root to leaf path and add this salary to all the nodes. Again, if you add, and then hire someone in 2000, you traverse this route to leave path, add two to everyone, or to every node on the path. And finally, a query can now be answered by searching for the successor of 2007. Okay, so that has some route to leave path in the tree. Uh, so it, it has this path here, the one shown in red. And the idea is now you can just add the value stored in the nodes Root, the roots of the subtrees hanging off to the left of this path, right? So you add six and zero, and then you get the total salary expenses here. Okay, so this one, this time, uh, the update time and the query time are basically log n, right? So, so you've uh, paid a little bit in update time, but gained a lot in query time. And so this problem here is called prefix sums. It's a special case of range counting that we'll see in a, in a few seconds. Uh, it's a, basically a 1D version of, of range counting. And so what we generally care about in dynamic data structures is to study this trade-off between the time we spend updating our representation and the time we spend querying it. Okay, so these are the two main parameters. You can also care about space, but uh, update time essentially gives a bound in the space. So if you have an update time of TU and you have N operations, the biggest data structure you can build uses space N times TU. So generally, uh, if we already have a bound on the update time, we also sort of give some bounds on the space-time trade-offs. Okay, so here it's the update time and the query time, TQ, that we really care about. Okay. Uh, so I guess the holy grail, at least in, in, in lower bounds, is to prove uh, that you cannot have a faster data structure than the solution we already know. So basically, we want to prove that this binary tree solution is, is optimal. Uh, for this prefix sum problem. Okay. So what we're trying to prove, and also in this talk, would be 
unconditional lower bounds on the maximum of the update time and the query time, or generally just trade-offs between the update time and query time. Okay, but unconditional lower bounds. And so to prove these unconditional lower bounds, uh, we need a model of uh, what a data structure can do. And the model that we use to prove lower bounds in is the cell probe model by Yao, dating back to 1981. And the idea here is that uh, you view a data structure as a, an array of memory cells. So think of this as your RAM. Each cell has W bits, so it's a parameter. And then they have an address. OK, so it's just a big array. They're addressed by numbers in 2 to the W. So we think of the addresses also as being W bit integers. So think of your real computer, right? W is, say, 64 or 32. The general assumption that we make is that this word size W is uh, theta log n. Okay, so the motivation for doing this, uh, for having this, this uh, assumption, is that we assume that any, any memory cell has enough bits to address any other memory cell and has enough bits to specify an index into the sequence of updates that you've seen, okay, which is realistic, right? It's, on a 64-bit uh, address is enough to to address any uh, 64 bits is enough to address any RAM cell that you that you have, right? So, so we'll have the assumption that W is uh, theta log n. Okay. Now, a data structure here, a dynamic data structure, uh, receives a sequence of uh, update operations and queries. In general, we'll say we have n of these operations. OK, so update one, update two, update three, update four. Then maybe a query comes, Q5, another update, and a query, and an update. So they can be interleave these updates and queries. So And when you see an update, so then the data structure is allowed to, to change the memory. And that's the idea. You, you go and you change the memory. Uh, so for instance, you can, you can write any w bit, uh, any w bit bit string into one of these cells. And you can think of them as having any sort of interpretation that you want. Maybe it's just bit strings that you write into these cells. So when you get the update, um, you're allowed to read and write cells of uh, your memory. And if you read up to TU of these cells, a probe TU of these cells, then you say that your update time is TU. Okay. And when you do this, you're allowed to be adaptive so that the memory cell that you choose to read is allowed to or write to is allowed to depend on what you see in the content in the cells out there. So for instance, this next update comes, it writes, say, maybe you can have a pointer that should represent jump to 112. Maybe it, it then branches to this cell and modifies the content, replaces it with something else, and so forth. So the memory could just have any sort of uh, contents that you like, W bit strings. And uh, when you get a query, you again answer your query by adaptively reading up to TQ of the cells. Okay, so you can think of the query algorithm as just a depth TQ decision tree, where the root specifies uh, what cell do I read first. And then it has two to the W uh, children, the root based on what is the contents of the cell. So you're allowed to branch uh, based on what you see. Okay, so you read in general up to TQ things uh, when you answer a query. And I guess the idea here in the model is that what you choose to write and read to the cells can be any function of what you've seen so far and the update, OK? So this is captured by having this. It's just a big decision tree that specifies the query algorithm and the update algorithm, OK? So we don't restrict ourselves to having specific operations available on the stuff that we've uh, read or, or written to. We can have any, essentially what we choose to do can be any function of all the stuff that we've seen so far while answering this query or performing this update. Uh, of course, the strength of this is that if you can prove a lower bound in this model where the, essentially the, the data structure can do any instruction that it likes in constant time, then of course the lower bound holds for any sort of data structure you could imagine implementing. Right, so basically what we lower bound when we prove lower bounds here is just the number of memory accesses. Right? TU is the number of cells that we read, and TQ is the number of cells that we read when answering a query. Okay. So it's just number of, of memory accesses that we, that we count. Okay. So these lower bounds hold for any data structure that you, you want. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question here. So are there any yeah. known separations between 
cell probe model and like actual data structures? Um, so I guess we so uh, we have problems where I think we believe that there's a separation. And the, the thing is that we cannot really prove the separation unless we have another way of proving lower bounds, say for word RAM data structures. Then we need to take sort of computation into account. And if we want to prove something that, let's say the bottleneck is computation, uh, then we have to use a different model than, than the Silpop model. But we don't know how to prove such such lower bounds. Uh, sometimes you can you can have some lower bounds and some old lower bounds for dictionaries where you data structure. What it can do each time is an AC zero instruction that it can p perform on what it has read so far. Uh, but but in general, this is the only model that we use to prove lower bounds in. Um, for instance, problems such as priority queues, um, you can actually show that you can have constant time, amortized constant time priority queues in the, in the cell probe model. We don't know if that's true in, in the word RAM. Uh, I see. Yeah. OK. OK, so let me just try to like, give you the history of a, a dynamic cell probe low bounds. I'm not going to show you all the papers on dynamic cell probe low bounds. I'm going to show you sort of when we managed to prove higher lower bounds than ever before, right? So the strongest lower bounds that we, that was attained for the maximum of the update time and query time. Okay, and as you'll see, uh, we haven't really come that far. Uh, it's, it's basically pretty hard to prove these lower bounds uh, when the model is that powerful, right? It can, it's, it's really hard to show that you cannot uh, have efficient data structures. So I think the first real lower bound that was proved for dynamic data structures was proved in 1989 by Friedman and Sachs, who proved a log n over log log n lower bound uh, for a bunch of dynamic problems, okay, also natural dynamic data structure problems. And for many of these problems, this was actually the right answer. Okay, And the technique they introduced is called the chronogram method, and we'll get back to that uh, in a few slides. Okay, So that was sort of the first paper on uh, proving dynamic low bounds for dynamic data structures. And it took another 15 years before uh, any improvements were made over this bound. It was in 2004 when uh, Mihai Patrasco and Eric Demain uh, proved the first log and lower bound. Okay, so uh, for an explicit problem, it says here. So by counting arguments, we can show that they exist. If we pick a random problem, it's going to be hard. But for an explicit problem, the highest lower bound was this log n by uh, Mihai and Eric. This problem was proof for a dynamic graph connectivity. So it's also a natural data structure problem that we have this lower bound for. Okay. And then it took another eight years before this bound was improved in 2012. I had this paper that uh, Thomas mentioned in the beginning that got the, the stock best paper award in, in 2012, uh, where basically we pushed the barrier to essentially log squared n. It's basically log n over log log n squared was the, the, the lower bound we could prove. And this was proved for a data structure problem we'll get back to, which is uh, basically range counting in 2D, but where you have weights on the points. Uh, I'll show you the problem in a, in a slide or two. Now, the real issue with this, uh, or not, it's not really an issue, but for some, for some problems that you want to prove low amount for, there's an issue with this technique. Uh, and the thing is that for technical reasons that I'll also show you, uh, this technique really only works if the data structure problem you're trying to prove a low amount for has a large output. Okay, so the answer to a query should be a large in a large range. Okay, so you should have a, many possible answers to a query. Okay, so for instance, for decision problems where you just have to say yes or no, uh, there's no hope of using this technique for proving a log squared lower bound. Okay, so it's just doomed to fail, and, and you'll see that soon. Yeah. So what it really uses is that uh, when you answer a query the answer that you get back has to reveal a lot of information uh, about the database. And this same uh, barrier is also encountered in, in all these other papers uh, that you see here. So there really seems to be some fundamental barrier in trying to prove lower bounds beyond log n if you have uh, just, say, a decision problem. Okay, And if you look at sort of measure a lower bound as, uh, say, the cost per output bit, the highest lower bound is still just log in uh, by Petrasco and Domain, because this is a decision problem. Graph connectivity, right? You just have to say yes or no. Are these two nodes connected or not? Okay. So um, what we'll try to do uh, here is I'll show you some new lower bound results um, for problems that, are, uh, that don't have a large output size. Okay. 
Now, so also another thing that I want to talk about here is that let's say we, we have, of course, the holy grail is to prove lower bound stronger than log squared n. Uh, and to do that, we actually have to prove lower bounds higher than log n for Boolean problems. Just try to, to convince you why, why this is the case. Um, so, so let's say that you want to prove a little omega log squared and lower bound for some data structure problem that has a large output, say log n bit output. Then if you manage to prove such a lower bound, then you automatically have a little omega log n lower bound for a decision problem. Okay, so why is that? So that is because you can you can define a new data structure problem, which has uh, a query in this new problem is a pair, consisting of a query to the old problem, and an index uh, in uh, zero to log n, and then the goal is just to output the ith bit of the answer to the data structure problem that had log n bit output. Okay, so if you had a little omega log squared and lower bound for the first problem with log n bit output, then you automatically have a little omega log n lower bound uh, for this sort of contrived lower bound where you just ask for one bit the output. Right? So we really have to prove little omega log n lower bounds for decision problems before we can hope to prove little omega log squared n lower bounds for general problems. Okay. Uh, so what we present here, uh, I'll show you in this talk, is the first little omega log n lower bound for decision problem. It's in fact a, essentially a log to the 1.5 n lower bound um, for a bunch of different decision versions of data structure problems. Okay, And so, so one of the, I think the most important one of these problems is uh, range counting, where you just have to, so you just have a set of points in 2D and a query asks for the number of points inside a rectangle. I again show you in a few slides. Uh, if you just want the parity of the number of points, then you can prove a, a log to the 1.5 and lower bound. And this actually also gives the first uh, lower bound beyond log n for the normal version of range counting, which is what you typically see. Okay. And this problem has a log squared and upper bound. Okay. And so this problem proving a little omega log and lower bound uh, for actually for range counting over F2. It's actually posed as an open problem in uh, Mihai Patrascu's obituary, one of five important open problems in, in data structures. Uh, so we're really happy to make, finally make some progress on, on one of these five problems that Mihai uh, set forth. Uh, okay. And of course, this has a, this uh, contribution, really, we need a whole new technique for proving these lower bounds, right? Because the, as I mentioned before, the previous technique from 2012 it's just doomed to fail for decision problems. And um, I want to try to show you why the previous technique fails, um, also to motivate uh, how we came up with this new uh, technique. <clears throat> so uh, the, as mentioned, the previous uh, super log and uh, lower bound techniques really needs, needs a large output size. OK, and we'll try to, to, I'll try to explain to you why uh, this is necessary for the previous techniques. Um, and in doing that, I'll just go over this uh, this technique from 2012 that proved these log squared and lower bounds for for range counting. Okay, so here's the problem, just to so everyone knows. That in this data structure problem, you have a set of points in the n by n grids, let's say, so in 2D, and these points you can assign them weight. So an update specifies a weight to assign to these points. So for instance, you can set this weight to 202. Another update sets the weight of this point to 17. This uh, point gets a weight of 6, 23, and so forth. OK, so updates assign weights to points. And a query is then given by a 2D point as well. And it asks to um, sum the weights assigned to points dominated by the query. OK, so you have to sum the weights inside this, this rectangle here. So for instance, the answer to this query is 6 plus 17 plus 23, which is something like 46 or something. Okay. So the idea is that you have to sum the weights here. And so, so Kasper, the, the, yeah. sorry. The updates, they, um, they reset the weight. Like if the point existed already with a different weight, it's not yes. that you add or subtract, you just reset. 
you can so okay so from when people study this problem from an upper bound point of view i guess they they study the version where you insert a new point with a weight and you can delete previous points when we prove the lower bounds for this problem we actually proved it in this more restricted version where you just there's a fixed set of points in advance and then you can assign weights to them and you just assign a weight once to every point okay oh, so the points are known and there's the points are anywhere points. from there could be n squared points or there's, uh, there's only there's only n possible locations there's only n points uh, in the n by n grid you, you know these n points in advance for the lower okay. bound to hold okay, okay uh, thanks. yeah uh, but of course if you prove a lower bound for this restricted version it's it also applies to the more general version where you just insert points one by one in, in arbitrary positions but you know just think of you have n points and you can assign them weights n fixed points and so the idea here for, for uh, the previous technique to work is that these weights have to be rather large. So something like 10 log n bit weights. Okay, so they have to be, be quite large for the lower bound to, to go through. Okay. Okay, and so there's an upper bound for this, uh, for this problem. Maybe you've had a computational geometry course at some point and you've seen these range trees. So you can basically have a dynamic range tree, uh, if you know what those are. It's a very old uh, data structure from 1975, and it gives a data structure that has both update time and query time log squared in. So the lower bound that we get from this previous technique is essentially tight uh, when you assign, uh, when you have weights on the points. Okay. Uh, and the lower bound, to be precise, that was proved in 2012 was that since the maximum of the update time and query time has to be log n over log log n squared. So quite close to the upper bound. So, so I have a question. So for upper bound, there is no known way to shave, to shave dub, dub, like log logs or anything like this. So log square n is really the best we know. Uh, yes, if you have weights, log square n is really the best. If you just have points that you insert and there's no weight, you just have to count the number of points, then you can actually get log n over log log n uh, squared. I see. Okay. But the lower bound does not hold for this unweighted version. Uh, the lower bound only holds uh, with the weights. Okay. Okay, so let's try to just show you the idea in this proof. Um, so for now, let's just assume we have some data structure for range counting in 2D with weights that has a low update time, say polylog and update time. Okay. And then the idea in the proof is to try to show that if I do, if I consider a sequence of n random updates for some carefully chosen distribution, then if I ask a query at the end of this sequence of updates, and we want to try to prove that this query has to read essentially log squared in uh, memory cells to answer the query. And here I'm, I'm ignoring fully log logs just to make the math simpler on the slides. And the idea is that you've, if you think about the updates, okay, as happening uh, from left to right in time, okay, so this is the, the first update happens over here to the left. And then so you, the sequence of updates happens from, from left to right. So you have an, the last update happening over here. And the idea is to divide this sequence of updates into epochs. Okay, so this is an idea of Fredman and Sachs that was done in their original paper. And these epochs have a essentially geometrically decreasing sizes, right? So the size of the i-th epoch is beta to the i, where beta is some polylog. Okay. So you have these batches of updates that you divide, you divide your, your update sequence into to batches. So the smallest batch of update is the one, updates the ones happening just before you have to answer the query, and the largest batch of updates is the first one that happens, okay? And the requirement on this beta for the technique to work is that the beta has to be larger than the update time times the word size for, for technical reasons. Okay, so you have this, this sequence of updates divided into epochs. So there's basically, if so there is log base beta of n uh, up, uh, epochs, because the sizes uh, go up by factor beta each time, and ignoring pulley log logs, this is just log and different epochs, okay? And so what they did in, in this old paper by Fredman and Sachs uh, was to basically essentially argue that because these epoch sizes go down uh, geometrically, this data structure problem in some sense, this dynamic problem essentially reduces into log n independent static problems. Okay, so let's try to sort of convince you why or why you can think of it in, in that way. So the idea is since the updates happen in time from left to right, if I look at sort of the i-th epoch, so some epoch here in the middle, uh, everything that the data structure did 
before seeing these updates, everything it wrote to memory cannot really contain any information about the ith epoch, simply because these updates happened in the past, right? So you don't even know what these updates are yet, right? So, so all the stuff that you did here is some, in some sense useless uh, for representing uh, this epoch. And now all these future epochs, the ones that happen after the ith epoch, because of this geometric decay in size, uh, everything these updates change in memory. They change so few cells that basically you cannot write down enough information about the ith epoch to, to do anything useful. Okay, so, so one way to see this is that if you look at, at some epoch, uh, say the, the i minus first epoch, then there's beta to the i minus one updates in this epoch. And if the worst case update time is tu, then they change only tu memory cells and they don't have time to change more memory cells. And each of these memory cells have w bits. And since beta is more than tu, w, say some, maybe a few factors larger, uh, polynomial factors larger, then all these previous epochs, they just contain so little information that they can't say anything uh, useful about the ith epoch, all these small epochs. Okay, so that's the idea that all the small epochs, they, you don't have enough time to do anything useful about the ith epoch, and all the previous epochs they happened in the past, so they cannot say anything useful again about this epoch. So in that sense, you essentially get log n independent static problems, and then you try to prove a lower bound on these static problems uh, and sum them up. So that's sort of the idea in, in the Fredman and Sachs. Uh, so, 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 so for this to work, you need your distribution of updates to be like product, essentially, so all of them are yes. independent. Yeah. Yes, and then they are in, in the uh, lower bound they proved using this technique, yeah. Okay. Um, so let me just try to then give you, to be a bit more formal about this. So what you do is you say, okay, so look at this data structure after this sequence of updates. It wrote some stuff to memory. Okay, so these are memory cells. And then you divide these cells into sets, one for each epoch. So the set AI contains the memory cells that will last, whose last update happened during epoch i. Okay, so a sub i are the memory cells that were overwritten during the updates of epoch i, but not in epoch i minus one down to epoch one. Okay, so their last update happened during epoch i. Those are the, the memory cells associated with epoch i. Okay, so this is an important definition. Okay, so what we want to show now uh, in the technique from 2012 is that, uh, that if I pick a random query at the end of this sequence of updates, so one of the a random point uh, that I want to, to answer the query for, then we basically want to show that it has to read log n cells from each of these sets of cells. Okay, so log n cells associated to every epoch in expectation. That's what we want to try to prove. Uh, and of course, because these sets of cells are disjoint, a cell is only stored in one of these sets, namely the set corresponding to the epoch in which the cell was last updated. You can sum essentially these lower bounds over all the epochs. You have log n epochs, you have to read log n cells from each. So the total query time has to be log squared n. Okay. So that's what, how the, the proof goes. Um, okay, so basically this observation means that when you want to prove a lower bound, uh, we can just sort of zoom in on each epoch one at a time and try to prove a log n lower bound uh, for one epoch. So that's how the proof goes. You just fix one epoch and then you try to prove a log n lower bound on that one. And if you can do that for every epoch or just for most epochs, you can sum them up and get a log squared n lower bound. Okay, so the idea is just to try to prove for epoch i, you have to read log n cells from uh, the cells associated to epoch i. Okay. So the idea for proving that you have to read log n cells from epoch i um, is as follows. Okay, so, so you try to do a proof by contradiction. So you assume that the data structure actually proves and probes little o of, say, log n or log base beta of n cells from epoch i. Okay, so it proves very, probes less cells than what we're trying to prove. And we're going to get a contradiction by giving an encoding argument, an encoding algorithm that can take this sequence of updates ui and compress it into a bit string of length little o of the entropy of this sequence of updates. 
and so that you can get the sequence of updates uh, back from this compressed version. Okay. So it's in some sense, you can think of it as an, a game where you have uh, Alice on one side that has this sequence of updates, you have Bob on the other side. Um, and so this green patch here in the middle is uh, the updates corresponding to Epic Eye. And so they can maybe disagree on some fixed sequence of updates in the other epochs. And then Alice wants to try to encode this UI. So Alice is the only one knowing UI, and she wants to compress this or send the message to Bob so that Bob can recover UI. Okay. Um, and so the technique, the, the way of trying to get this contradiction is, is as follows. Okay, so the encoding that Alice will try to do is, uh, so, so, so Bob, Bob and Alice agree on these updates in the other epochs. <clears throat> now Alice is going to run through the sequence of updates, including the updates of epoch uh, I, and at the end, she knows what this set AI is. Then she'll sample these memory cells uh, independently in probability P, which is something like one over polylog. So she just samples, picks a random sample of the cells uh, that are associated with epoch I. And this random set of cells, she just sends them to Bob. So that's the first part of this encoding message. She just sends the sample of cells. And then what she also sends is she looks at the updates here in the future from UI minus one to U1. And she collects the set of cells that they change these updates. And she just sends all of them to Bob as well. Okay, so all the sets A sub less than I. She just sends all of them to Bob. Okay, so in some sense, if you look at it, she runs through this entire sequence of updates. There's some big memory now. Now, some subset of them, these light green ones, are those uh, that are associated to Epoch I. She picks a random sample of them. She flips a coin for each. She gets this dark green sample, and that is what she sends to Bob. Okay, so she sends this subset of memory cells to Bob. Okay, and then she sends all the up all the cells that are changed here in the future uh, epochs as well. Okay, so we have to try to convince ourselves that Bob can actually uh, recover UI uh, from this message that she that he got from from Alice. Okay, so it's not clear right now that just sending this sample of cells is going to help Bob in any way. But let's try to to see how you can actually argue that Bob uh, will will learn this set UI from the sample. Okay, so Bob's idea, when Bob's received this message, or the decoder received this message from Alice, uh, the decoder knows everything except Epoch I, right? So they've agreed on everything that happened before Epoch I and everything that happened after Epoch I. And so Bob also received this sample of cells. And what he does is that he, sometimes he runs the data structure until just before Epoch I. So he runs all these updates. And then he, he looks at this set of cells C. It changes, it says, specifies some memory cells that were changed during Epoch I. So Bob will essentially update the memory uh, using what he just received. And he'll also update his memory based on what he sees from these future epochs. Now the idea is that Bob will just try to answer as many queries as he can, okay, given the information that he received. Okay. So basically the idea is that Bob will just try to, he will, he will take each query in turn. Okay, so we're on this n by n grid, so there's n squared queries. Bob will just try every query one at a time. And he'll just start, start running the query algorithm for this query. And so if you look at one of these queries, what is the chance that he can actually answer it? Okay, so when can Bob answer the query correctly? All right, so you see he received this set of cell C. And so what is the chance he can answer the query? So Bob can answer the query correctly precisely if uh, the data structure does not read any cell in epoch i that was not sampled. Right. So uh, if everything that the data structure probes from epoch i was sampled, uh, then Bob can answer it. OK, is this clear? Yeah, I guess it is. Um, so, so in some sense, like Bob has uh, a query. He tries to run the query algorithm. It reads a bunch of cells. And uh, 
if all the light green ones uh, are sampled, then Bob will be answer, able to answer the query. Okay, because he received all the contents of all the cells. Okay, so what is the chance that Bob can actually answer his query? Right, so we already assumed that that the data structure reads little of log base beta of n uh, cells from epic i. Okay, so it doesn't read too many light green cells. This is our contradictory assumption. We sample the cells at rate one over polylog. So basically, Bob can answer a query with probability at least say one over n. Okay. So he just needs all the cells that it reads from AI to be sampled, then he can answer it correctly. Okay. So so this means that since there's n squared total, the total number of queries is n squared. There should be at least n queries that Bob can actually answer from the message that he received. Okay. So in some sense, if we just hand wave and assume that these queries, the answers to the queries are in some sense completely independent of each other, which is, I guess, not the case for range counting. But let's say that the answers to the queries are n-wise independent, meaning that every query that I can answer reveals a bit about a UI. Okay. Then Bob will actually learn the UI bits about epoch I. Okay. Does this make sense? So Bob, there's a large set of queries that Bob can still answer after this sampling. That's the general idea. Okay. But why is this a contradiction? So if we look at what was the size of this message that uh, Alice sent? All right, so let's look at what is the expected size of Alice's message. So basically, the size of the message is the same as the expected size of this sample times W. W bits for each cell in the sample. Okay. Now, we sampled the cells of epoch i at rate 1 over poly log n. Okay. So it's basically the number of cells associated to epoch i over some poly log n. And, um, but then how big can epoch i be? Epic I can be at most, there's UI updates, each changes TU cells. Okay. So if the sample rate is, say, less than 1 over TU uh, W, then the size of this message is very small compared to the number of bits that Bob will learn. Okay. So that will give this uh, contradiction, an information theoretic contradiction, right? Because as Shannon's source coding theorem says that we cannot uh, if we have some, if we cannot encode a string of entropy, say UI bits, uh, in less than UI bits in expectation. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the general idea is just sample these memory cells associated to epoch i, and then show that there will be a large subset of queries you can still answer afterwards. Okay. Now, I guess range counting, as I said does not have this n-wise independence property, but you can actually make it work, right? This is, the overall idea is what you see here, that there's a large set of queries that survive, they reveal a lot of information, and the size of the message is smaller than the amount of information they reveal. So that's the so general ju framework. Ju ju just to check my understanding, uh, so in this intuition, you haven't used uh, large output, right? I have not used large output, that's correct. Uh, and there's also a problem with what I just showed you. It actually, so you're sort of getting to the next slide here. There's actually, so I'm, there's one thing I, I skipped here. There's, there's a big issue with this approach uh, that I just showed you here. And the problem is that uh, Bob does not know what are these queries that he can answer. Okay. So let me just try to, to convince you about why this is the case. Right? So we know by the previous slide that there should be at least some n queries that Bob can actually answer given what the information that he receives from Alice. But the problem is that Bob does not know which queries he can answer. So, so if again, if you look at this picture here, let's say Bob picks some query, which is a, a 2D point, and then he starts to run the query algorithm. Okay, so this, this, the query algorithm reads in total, say, log squared n cells. That's what we're trying to prove. Uh, it doesn't read too many light green cells, but it also re it reads a lot of white cells. Okay, so it reads a lot of stuff that was updated outside epoch I. And now the problem is that Bob cannot see whether all the light green cells that it probes were actually sampled. 
Okay, so let me try to, to explain this again uh, slowly because this is quite important. Right, so Bob picks a query. He starts to run the query algorithm. Right? The query algorithm tells him to read this cell. Bob has the, the information that Bob has. Right? He ran the data structure up to just before a guy, so he built it up to that point. Then he updated the dark green cells based on the message he got from Alice. And finally, he also updated all the cells that were uh, updated in the future. Now, Bob has this query, so he starts to run the query algorithm. He, he sees a memory cell. OK, he knows if it is dark green before, because he can see that in Alice's message. So then he's fine. If the, if the cell that he's about to read is dark green, he's happy. If the cell he's about to read was updated in these future epochs, the small epochs, he's also happy because he can also see it in Alice's message. But the problem is when Bob is reading a cell that looks white to him. So he doesn't know whether it was, it, so he, the thing is you cannot distinguish a white cell from a light green cell from the message he receives from Alice. Okay, so Alice has just sent these dark green cells to him. This is a sample of the light green ones. But Bob, when Bob is say running the query algorithm and he gets to probing this cell down here, he doesn't know that it's light green. Okay? He doesn't know that it was actually updated during epoch I. So what he could do is say, well, the only thing he could do is just pretend it was not updated and just continue running the query algorithm. He actually gets some wrong answer back. Maybe he cannot even see that he got a wrong answer back. Okay. So this is really the, the, the crucial bottleneck here is that there's no way for Bob to know which queries he answers correctly and which he does not answer correctly. Okay. So at the end of the day, if Bob just runs his query algorithm, there's going to be n of the queries that are answered correctly and then n squared minus n that might be total garbage, but he doesn't know which ones are garbage. OK. So this is where the large output size uh, comes in. Uh, and the idea is now that Alice, so Alice knows everything. Uh, but he, she knows all the cells of all the epochs. So Alice can just look and figure out, find n of these queries uh, that succeeds. OK, so we know that there will be n of them that succeeds. Alice can actually figure out which ones it is. Right, so Alice can find n queries that, that uh, succeed. And she, what she'll do is she'll just send Bob uh, the indices of such n queries. Okay. Now, sending the index of a query. So in it, a query is a, is a 2D point on an n by n grid. So that takes two log n bits to send to, to tell Bob what query to run. Okay, and that is precisely why we need this large output that each query reveals 10 log n bits. Because then we still get a contradiction even though Alice spends two log n bits for every query that Bob is going to answer. So this is really the, the main idea in this 2012 paper was to, to sort of see that there is this large set of queries that, you can, that Bob can answer. Bob does not know which ones it is, but Alice can tell Bob which queries he can answer. Uh, in say two log n bits, and if they reveal more information, they will still get a contradiction. Okay, so that's the idea in in the previous paper. Okay, and the whole problem was this not being able to see that you you read this light green cell. Okay, so that, that's the real bottleneck. Okay, and of course, right. So so it's really crucial here if you look at it. So Alice is going to tell Bob which queries to run. This really means that. The, the data structure problem that you try to prove a lower bound for using this technique, it really must have the property that the information that you learn from answering a query should be more than it takes to describe a query. So you need, really need these log n bits of information to be revealed in order for this technique to, to work. Okay, and this is precisely why the previous technique needs problems that have a log n bit output, or actually log number of queries uh, bit output. And that's the same for all these papers that have since then proved lower bounds uh, on data structures of this log squared n type. We always need to, to tell, in some sense, a decoder which queries to run. OK. But of course, um, when we go to the Boolean version of this problem, right, when we have a, a decision problem, right, this approach is just doomed to fail, right? We can never, if we try to tell Bob which queries to run, we already spend log n bits telling Bob which queries to run, but each query just reveals one bit of information. Right, so there's just no hope of using this technique uh, for Boolean or decision problems. OK, so what we'll do now, I'll try to show you how we sort of uh, move beyond this barrier. OK, 
So let's look at a Boolean data structure problem P. And what we're going to do is we're again going to, to have these epochs as before. And we're basically going to do sort of an encoding argument or say a, a one-way communication game for these epochs. So we're going to consider these uh, communication games, one for every epoch. And the idea in this communication game is that uh, Alice receives as input uh, the updates of all the epochs, okay? So you are to you one, and Bob receives all updates except those in epoch I, and then Bob receives a query. Okay, so it's sort of similar. To, so, so this time we're not encoding uh, UI, but we're trying uh, to have Bob answer this query. Okay, so the goal is that Bob should answer the query uh, after they have communicated. Okay, so this is sort of a natural one-way communication game. Alice looks at all the updates, sends a message to Bob, and then Bob has to answer the query based on the message from Alice and information about all other epochs than epoch I. Okay. So this is like an, the epoch communication game corresponding to epoch I. So this is the, the basic problem we'll be studying uh, in this new setup. Okay. So it's very similar to before, uh, except that Bob has a query. He's not trying to recover UI. He's just trying to answer one query. Afterwards, so this looks very much like what you see in, say, streaming lower bounds, where you have one-way communication uh, games uh, to prove lower bounds. Okay, so of course, uh, there's always a trivial protocol uh, for this problem, which is just Alice just sends uh, everything that happened in Epoch I. Right. That's the trivial protocol. So what we'll try to look at here is what happens if Alice sends slightly less than the trivial amount of bits. Okay, so here's our main technical result, which is in some sense a simulation theorem that shows that if you have a data structure uh, for this dynamic problem, which has a good worst case update time to U and expected query time to Q, then from this data structure you can get an efficient communication protocol for this one-way communication game. Okay. And so let me just try to pass what this one says. So what it says is that if you have this data structure, then you can get a one-way protocol pi for this epoch communication game. So Alice holds u1 to ur, Bob has everything except epoch i, and a query. For most of the epochs, you can get a protocol such that in this protocol, Alice will send, say, this number of updates in epoch i, over TUW to the 10, or some big polynomial, right? So, so this is quite a lot less than the trivial bound. Okay, so Alice sends something that's quite a lot less than the trivial amount of information to Bob. And then afterwards, after Alice has sent this message to Bob, the probability that Bob can answer the query is going to be at least one half, plus something that's exponentially small in the query time, log squared of TUW over root log n. Okay, so let me just, uh, if you just ignore log log factors, this is basically one half plus exponentially small in TQ over root log n. Okay, so Bob is correct, just with probability tiny, tiny fractions better than random guessing. Okay, so probability one half is just random guessing, so just have some slight advantage over random guessing. Okay. Let me just try to show you why can you use this theorem to get a data structure a lower bound for a problem. Okay, so why does it help to have tiny advantage over guessing? So if you think of a data structure problem as mapping a sequence of updates to a vector, that just have the, the answers to all the queries, right? So every sequence of updates, there's a sequence of ans there's a vector of answers. They're saying the answer to every query. Then if you have a good one-way uh, protocol that is correct with probability slightly better than random guessing, this means that if I run this protocol, in some sense, I'm going to, if, I, if Bob tries to answer all the, the queries afterwards, after receiving the message from Alice, he'll basically be able to get a vector back. So if he writes down the, the answer that he thinks uh, is the right answer to every query, he'll get a vector back that's fairly close to the true answer vector. And so let's say this is the true answer vector. Bob will be able to recover some vector that is fairly close in Hamming distance to the true answer vector. 
okay? In particular, it's going to be within a distance one half minus exponentially small into Q or root log n, right? Now, if you think of the data structure problem, just imagine that uh, on every sequence above that, you just get a uniform random sequence of, of answers. So it's basically like uh, these answer vectors uh, correspond to a random code. Then you can show just by uh, probabilistic arguments that even within a ball of radius one half minus exponentially small in, in log n, there's going to be very few code words. Which means that, that Bob, after learning this, this point here, there's going to be very few black points corresponding to inputs inside this box. Okay, so ba basically Bob almost learns what the, the input is. Okay, so that's, that's basically sort of the idea if, if, in why this theorem is useful. Um, and, and so what you can show is then that this advantage that you have here, this TQ over root log n that you get from the protocol, this advantage have, must be less than log n. Okay. If you rearrange, you get the TQ is at least log to the 1.5 n. So that's sort of the idea is that uh, if, if your data structure problem behaves like a, a random code in some sense, if you look at these answers on different inputs, then you can get these log to the 1.5 and lower bounds because this advantage is, is still good enough to, to give you something close to the true answer vector. That's sort of the intuition. Okay, but I'll use the last few minutes. I guess we start a little bit late. So the last few minutes, I'll try to show you the proof of this uh, simulation theorem, okay, and how we actually try to prove um, and you can get this efficient protocol uh, from a data structure. Okay, so let me just assume this TUW, it's just some polylog and just to keep things simple. Uh, and we had this, uh, we try to show, we'll try to show that we can get this advantage TQO root log n over random guessing. Okay. Okay, so we'll assume we have this, the, the update time is uh, polylog n, and we want a message of size ui over polylog n. And, okay, so we, we know already by the same arguments as, as before that on average, the data structure is going to read TQ over log n cells from uh, each epoch. So we can find an epoch where you read few cells, just like in, in the uh, 2012 approach. Um, now, natural idea for Alice is to, to try, just do like, uh, so everything except epoch I is known to both players. Alice could just try to generate the the memory contents at the end, and could try to send everything that happens in the future, and try to send a sample of the cells. So I just try to do as we did uh, in the 2012 paper. You know, just pick a random sample, send it to Alice, uh, send it to Bob, and send all the future uh, updates to Bob as well. All right, so, so it's basically the same picture as before. Um, and what we'll be looking at is this event WQ, which is the event that Everything that the data structure reads on query Q from epoch I is in the sample. Okay, so this is the event that you can actually answer the query from the sample, that you can answer it correctly. Okay. Then as we argued before, again, the probability that you can actually answer the query is the sampling rate to the TQ over log n. Okay, so this is just, you have to sample all the cells that you read. It's ignoring polylog logs. This is basically exponentially small in TQ over log n, just like in, in the previous setup. You just sample cells. You look at the chance you can answer it. And let's call this probability epsilon. And of course, like before, if Bob uh, could knows when this event happened, if he knew that he could answer his query, then you already you were already done, right? Because if Bob could detect this event, he could just say, okay, if the event happened, I answer the, the query correctly. If the event doesn't happen, I just flip a coin. Okay, and then I already get this advantage that I'm looking at. In fact, I'm getting a better advantage that, than what I claimed on the previous slide. And you'd get log squared and lower bounds. But the problem is, uh, like, like before, uh, Bob doesn't know that he has all the information he needs to answer his query. Okay, so that's, that's the same issue as before. Uh, so what we try to do is to try to find another way to uh, to answer the query. Okay, so the natural idea the question to ask is what could Bob uh, try to do uh, if not try to detect this event WQ? And of course, what what he the most general idea for Bob is to given the information he receives, 
we just output the maximum likelihood estimate for what the answer is. And that's, of course, the best strategy uh, you, could, you could try to do. Uh, so now, you can try to look at, so what, is, what advantage do you get? Do you gain anything by using this maximum likelihood estimate? And basically, if you look at it, uh, you can try to look at, so what advantage do I get? If the event WQ happened, uh, let's say I'm always correct when this event happens, but the event doesn't happen, the advantage I get is uh, sort of the probability that the answer is one, condition on what I've seen, uh, how, how far is this away from, from one half? Okay. I guess in the, for the sake of time, I just wanted to sort of, just for now, just say there's no guarantee that this is going to be different from zero. Okay, so basically it could be the case that, uh, that this maximum likelihood estimate just gives nothing. Okay, which is basically if, if the sample here has zero mutual information with the answer to the query. Okay, um, basically the same issue as before, right? So that's just, uh, you, you can't really sort of exploit that you know this event happens. And not what we've said so far. Okay. So the idea, the last idea is that maybe Alice can say a little bit more to Bob um, to avoid this cancellation of the advantage that uh, because Bob doesn't know when the event happened. Okay. So the idea is now, so, so if Bob, Bob received this message from Alice, Bob can then try to run the query algorithm on, on his query have some query path that's some memory cells that he reads let's say these he moves so along some path in his decision tree he probes some cells and um, so this let's call this set of cells uh, s sub q so he just runs the query algorithm. maybe it's incorrect maybe he read a light green cell without knowing it but it, he has some query path okay um, and we know once in a while this is going to be the correct query path okay so once in a while this this path in some sense reveals a lot of information. So there's some peak that once in a while you get a lot of information. And we want to say something about translate this into actually learning something all the time. Um, so here's sort of the question we ask. Um, so, so, so this information theoretic really question we have here. So we have k random variables. Think of these as the contents of the memory cells that Bob reads. B is an, another random variable. A uniform binary random variable in the same probability space. Think of this as the answer to the query. And if we have this property, we know that once in a while, there's this event that happens quite often, namely that uh, Alice's message has all the cells that we need. And when this event happens, if we know that this event happened, the, the entropy of B is zero. Okay, so think of this. Alice's message has everything we need to know. This is the event uh, set star. And the question we ask is, what is the smallest number of coordinates you can reveal? So how many of these set one to set k can you reveal such that the entropy of b conditioned on these, this subset of variables drops to say one minus some eta? Okay, so is there some smaller subset of uh, memory cells that you can reveal and still learn something? Um, and of course, this proving that there's something smaller than all k of them is hopeless if we didn't have this constraint that one, there's some quite, there's some assignment that happens quite often that reveals a lot of information. Because maybe B is just the XOR of set one to set K, in which case you need, you know, there's nothing, there's no small subset that reveals any information about, uh, about the answer. Okay. And so what we, we prove is that, um, that there is actually a subset of, if you have this, these properties up here, you can actually find root k times log one over epsilon uh, of these random variables. So if I only tell you those, I still get, I still uh, learn a lot of information. Okay, I learn, again, an advantage of root k log one over epsilon. Okay, so that's sort of the main technical lemma that we prove is that, um, that you can actually still find a small subset of these memory cells that will tell you uh, a lot of information. And I think I'll just skip to where, how we use it. So, so the idea is, now that we have this lemma, let's just finish the proof and skip the proof of the lemma. So what we, the parameters that we use is that um, k, the number of random variables, is the total query time, right? So we have one random variable given the contents of every cell that Bob reads. 
Okay, so these are one random variable each. They have some contents. Set is just the, the, the contents. B is the answer to the query. And set star, so this is the contents that this, this the assignment that happens quite often. So this is the contents of the memory cells conditioned on everything being in the sample. Okay. And so this is the this is basically the good event, right? This is the case when we know that Bob can answer the query. When Bob can answer the query, we actually get that this the contents of the cells are completely fixed. Because then the contents of the cells are included in the sample uh, and everything that he received from Alice. Okay, so there is this value that the cells take with rather large probability epsilon. Um, and then the, the lemma shows that Bob can actually find root k log 1 or epsilon uh, a subset of the cells of this size. So that if Alice actually tells Bob uh, the contents of those cells, then Bob will actually learn uh, at least exponentially small in root k log 1 or epsilon bits about the answer to the query. Okay, so this is what this lemma gives us, that there's a small subset of cells far from all of them that will still tell a lot of information about uh, the answer to the query. And this is enough to get the advantage over random guessing that we're after. So if we just insert what are these, these values, this k is the total number of cells that Bob reads. This was TQ. And uh, log 1 or epsilon is this TQ over uh, log n. Okay, so this, when we actually get this uh, advantage, advantage that's exponentially small in TQ over root log n, is, which is what we wanted. Um, so basically, this finishes the proof, assuming we can prove this uh, uh, peak to average lemma. Okay, so I think um, just uh, to finish off, Alice doesn't know what this set of cells is, depends on the query. So the last step is just to sample another random set of cells and send them uh, to Bob as well. And then with, with good probability, everything in this sample, everything in this subset that you need is also sampled. And then you get this advantage. Um, so, so, so this is sort of the, the general, uh, the main idea in, in our proof, in our new uh, result here is to, uh, to prove this peak to average lemma that if you have some event that happens rather often uh, that reveals a lot of information about your query, then you can sort of smoothen this out and average over uh, the cells that you read and find a small subset of cells that still reveal some information about uh, the answer. Okay. And uh, I think for the sake of time, I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Um, so let me just skip the, the proof here. It's not that long, but uh, let's just... It involves Chebyshev polynomials. Um, yeah, so read the paper if you want to, to see the details of, of how you can find this subset of cells. Okay, and uh, so just to finish off, what we prove is this log to the 1.5 n cell probe lower bounds for a bunch of dynamic Boolean data structure problems, in particular for this range counting problem. Uh, based on this new proof technique, uh, where we random sample some cells, uh, consider this uh, one-way communication game, uh, and try to show using this peak to average lemma that it's actually some small set of cells you can still reveal to, to learn a lot of information. Um, this uses some, uh, this is an interesting connection between this algebra of uh, Chebyshev polynomials and information theory. Um, and I we really strongly believe that it should be uh, more applications of this uh, uh, peak to average lemma than in data structure lower bounds. Okay, so thanks a lot for, for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe one quick question if anyone has those. Uh, yeah, if there's any questions, we can definitely take them. I had one small question. I saw you went quickly, but on your conclusion slide, you said something about this lemma being tight. Um, and I was wondering about that because the advantage. So, um, so it is the case that. So, what you mean by tight, basically? So, the the the, the way you stated it in terms of uh, okay, let me the advantage you get. Yeah. So, I guess it's the one that we skipped here. So, uh, yes, the, the idea is that. Um, let me just go back to the to the slide where it's actually uh, set here. Okay, so here's the one where it's tied. Uh, so, so the formal statement is this uh, is this one above uh, on the top here. So we have some function over the Boolean hypercube. Um, 
you can basically rephrase this uh, information theory question as the following. So, in some sense, it's a probability distribution. So, all the values sum to, to it has one norm at most one. There's some, uh, there's some peak. So, there's some, uh, there's some assignment uh, to the input that gives a large value. Then, what you can show is that you can find this subset of cells, say, or subset of coordinates. So there's a, it's a large bias uh, if you just condition on, on these uh, coordinates. Okay. So it uh, sounds a bit like, so this, this condition on the L infinity norm is saying something about, I mean, if they were negative, right? But let's say it's a distribution, so you're saying something about the entropy of the distribution, so it sounds a bit like a sort of chain rule uh, kind of statement for min entropy. Um, so you fix a small number of coordinates and you get a Large bias over the remaining is that? Yeah, I guess you could sort of phrase it mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so maybe looking at the one with this, the random variables. Yes. Yeah, so, so I guess yeah, you can you can sort of say that yeah, you can condition on some. If there's this event that happens, or this assignment that happens quite often, and when this happens, it reveals a lot of information. Then I guess we're saying that then there's some small subset of coordinates you don't need to know. Everything yeah. you don't need to actually be certain that this event happened, and so you can reveal some subset of the k uh, bits or the k k variables, and still uh, learn something from this smaller subset of variables. So, did you get? Um, could you flash? Um, so here you're stating it for fixed. But is there a trade-off between y and eta that you get? You know, if I reveal a bit more coordinates, then the eta will increase a little bit. If I fix a bit more coordinates, the eta will. Oh, increase a little bit. I guess we didn't actually try with larger. So I guess we were interested in getting as small an eta as possible, uh, as small a, a subset as possible for the data structure low bound. Uh, intuitively, you should. Yeah, I guess you should get a, a better eta if you have a larger set. Uh, I guess in the extreme, right? It should you should uh, learn everything here. Um, I guess I haven't tried to work it out, but. I guess we'll, we'll translate into multiplying with a higher degree Chebyshev polynomial, and I, I think you would probably get more information by by doing that. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that, that would be my intuition. Though I, we haven't really looked into it yet, uh, it's still rather new this result. And I, as, as mentioned, I think there's more to it than than just these data structure lower bounds. Uh, there's some more in this uh, peak to average lemma. I think. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, actually a room that I am in soon will be taken, uh, so maybe it's actually time to call it a day. Uh, th th thanks again for the talk, it's, it was like really great. So thing. we can still, Ilya, you can take us offline, but we can still hang out for a little oh, bit. So, right? so, so, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hosting it like in any... Yeah, that, that's, that's fine, but you can take us off the live and then we can okay. remain. If anyone has more questions for Casper, they can just hang out for... Okay, more. then I'm stopping the broadcast. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. See you in a couple of weeks uh, with uh, Santosh. Thanks again, Casper. Uh,